Good morning, church. Can we stand and sing together this morning?
Calvary West, good morning and welcome. It is so good to be with here, to be with here, with you here this morning, and to be with you who are joining us online. Listen, you guys can sit down for just a minute and uh, take a little mask break. As you do, I want you to think about something, the power of one of the lines that we just sang. I am who you say I am. Now, at first glance, that just sounds like a line in a song that we're singing together on a Sunday morning. But dig a little bit deeper and realize that what you're doing in that moment is consciously deciding that you will agree with God against every other voice in your life, that he gets the final word on who you are, on what you're worth, and on what he is calling you to. You are not the sum of your, your failures or your successes. You are not who your boss or your coworkers think you are. You are not your greatest mistake or your most recent mistake. You are not a political affiliation. You are none of those things at your core. At your core, you are who God says you are. His child adopted, redeemed through Jesus. An incredible truth to start out our service with. I hope that hits you in the same way if you're connecting with us at home. Listen, if this is your first Sunday with us, this is the type of truth that we sing and celebrate week in and week out at Calvary West. We are a place of belonging and hope where people know that they will be loved and cared for and where people will be connected to the help and the hope that only God can provide to us. And he does that faithfully all the time through Jesus. If you're a guest, I would love for you to let us know that you're here, either in the room or connecting online. You can do that through the main tabs above the media player. If you're in the room, you can do that on your uh, smartphone or iPad, calvarynow.com, and uh, you'll find the links there. Same thing if you're watching at home, tuning in, connecting with us this morning. I'm so glad that you are, let me say that. And also just above where you're watching, it says connect. You click on that, let us know who you are if you're joining for the first time. There's also space there that you can share prayer requests with us. Listen, we get those week in and week out. We say it every week because it is that important. We want to be walking with you through life. If there's something that we can be praying for you about, rejoicing with you about, or helping you navigate in your life, please, please, please let us know. It is always uh, just absolutely heartbreaking when we finally do learn about something that somebody has been keeping close to the chest for so long, and we just go, man, I wish we could have walked with you before this moment right now. We're always happy to do that. So if you're in the room, if you're online, you can do that as well. Now we're gonna stand and continue to worship. So masks on, if you're at home, freebie for you. Let's stand together. We're gonna focus our hearts and our minds now on who Jesus is. Good news. 
It's one thing to see, uh, sorry, to sing that the victory is his. And sometimes that's kind of hard to believe because we're not seeing it in our own lives in the way that we would like, right? Or we're not seeing it in the world in the way that we would like. And so this morning, Calvary West, I hope your faith is strengthened. I hope your heart is encouraged because you get to see that the victory belongs to our God through baptism. Calvary West, will you help me welcome Nikki Nikki is here this morning to be baptized. She's here in obedience to what Jesus said is good and right for us. She's here to declare to us, her church family, that she is indeed following Christ. And she is here drawing a line in the sand and saying, this I remember God was at work in my life. And in the days ahead when things are hard and things are tough, I will remember this moment when I celebrated the faithfulness and the goodness of of God. That's what baptism is. It's a celebration. Nikki's not here to be saved. She's here because she has been saved by God. And if you have never been baptized, man, I want to speak to you for just a moment. This is not, this is not just a, a, a formality. This is not just something that you do just because. This is a moment, a moment in time. It is a physical reminder where you act out the salvation that God has given you as a gift, and we all get to celebrate it together. I hope you're thinking about the moment of your salvation. I hope you're thinking back to the moment when maybe you were baptized as you see Nikki here preparing to tell it to the world that she's following Jesus. Now, Nikki, we talked about Romans 10, 9, and 10. The scripture says, if you uh, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so I want to ask you two questions based on that passage of Scripture. First is this. Is it true, Nikki, that you have confessed that Jesus is Lord of your life and you are trusting Him and Him alone to save you? Yes. And is it true that you believe that God raised Jesus up from the dead so that when you trust in Him, you also will be raised to eternal life? Absolutely. Well, Calvary West, it's based on a testimony, this testimony of faith in Jesus and Jesus alone, that I will baptize Nikki as my sister in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk. 
in a brand new life. is worth celebrating. Come on, let's celebrate it. Amen. Well, we're going to learn a new song this morning. Continue in worship. into because of the cross. It's all because of the cross. It's all because of the resurrection, Lord, that we have power in your name. And Father, we want to learn more about what it means to step into that freedom, to follow after you wholeheartedly, to not just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word, God. 
So teach us now in these moments. Give us hearts to receive the word that you have for us. Father, I pray you'd be with Ryan as he preaches to us this morning. I pray that he'd bring a message from your heart and that our hearts would receive it. Lord, we love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go ahead and take a seat. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, well, as we begin our uh, study in Philippians this morning, I want to take you back in time for just a few moments as we get started, okay? So imagine that it is not August of the year 2020, it is August 2003, okay? So we're going back 17 years now to August 2003. Get yourself there mentally, all right? And uh, in the year August 2003, a brand new Christian is making his way as a freshman at North Carolina State University, okay? Everybody got that picture in their mind? If you're having trouble, I think we've got some visual help that we can give you. (laughs) Now, this freshman doesn't really know anything about following Jesus, okay? He has just trusted Christ a couple weeks before school. He doesn't know anything about following Jesus. You can take that down now, thank you. Uh, He doesn't know anything about following Jesus, All he knows, really, all he knows is that what he was doing before wasn't working. That the following after himself, the chasing after his own desires, the doing whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, it was not working. And so he trusted Jesus just before he left for school. And uh, he had instructions from who, the person who became his new spiritual mentor. And the instructions were this, when you get to NC State, there will be a small group Bible study in your dorm, show up the first night. And they will take care of you from there. And so that's what I did. I went to NC State. I was staying in Tucker Hall as a freshman. And uh, sure enough, there were signs for Campus Crusade for Christ, now called Crew, uh, all over the place with information about our first small group Bible study. And so I showed up. I showed up at that first, uh, first small group Bible study. And the guys, we, you know, we kind of hung out, got to know each other for a little bit. And then our first study that semester was in the book of Philippians. Okay, and I, again, didn't know anything about anything. I had never read through the entire uh, New Testament or Old Testament or anything like that. And so, uh, where is Philippians? What's it about? You know, it's all brand new to me. And uh, I'm in this, we're, we're, we're sitting there, we're talking, you know, one night in the common room, 15 or 20 other guys, a couple of leaders and me, and we open up in our study of Philippians, and uh, we read a passage that I absolutely could not wrap my mind around. I just could not understand how it was possible to do what the Bible was saying that we should do. So open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to read that passage together. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. This is what the scripture says. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, If any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now, I have a pretty unreliable memory, and uh, I I do remember this moment, though, crystal clear. We read through this passage uh, in Tucker Hall, and um, I'm in a room with all these other guys who who clearly have done this before, right? Have you ever been the outsider, the new guy who doesn't get the activity that's happening or the sport that's being played or the discussion that's being had? That was me, okay? Completely insecure about that fact also, terrified to be called on to speak or to pray. I can remember the anxiety that I would get in those moments to this day. And we're in there, we're talking, and these guys, they all know exactly what to say about what we're talking about in Philippians. They all know exactly how to say it. 
right? And they all know exactly when to chime in, when to hold back, you know, and I'm just sitting there like a blank slate, terrified of being called on and, and still having this burning question inside of me, but how do you do this? And so at some point, I just blurted it out. I just said, I don't understand how you actually do this. I don't understand how you have that kind of what they're saying is humility. To do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Nothing? Nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit? Are you kidding me? How in the world can you get there? And the discussion went on. You know, they, we kind of talked about it for a second. Discussion went on, moved on. And, um, and I don't remember the rest of that night until I'm walking back to my room. And one of the leaders, his name was Tim. He was an intern with crew that year, which meant he had just graduated. So he was uh, spending his year as an intern with crew. And he walks up to me as I'm heading back to the dorm. He says, hey, man, it sounds like you've got some questions. Why don't we go grab lunch and we can talk more? Why don't we go grab lunch and then we can talk some more? And in my mind, I'm a contrarian by nature. So in my mind, I'm going like, good luck with that lunch. You're never going to convince me that this is actually possible. But I said, okay. So we went to lunch. And uh, we started talking, and, um, and, and, you know, fast forward a little bit, right? But in that moment, God used a letter that was written almost 2,000 years ago to people that I had never met in a place that I had never been, a paragraph out of that letter, to fundamentally change the course of my life. To absolutely change the course of my life. Tim and I didn't just meet for lunch one time. We began meeting every single week for several years until he went overseas with crew to Lebanon. And he discipled me. I began to learn what it meant to follow after Jesus. Later that year, I went on my first mission trip. I think I mentioned that a couple weeks ago. That next summer when I was home, I was baptized. In the fall, I began to lead a small group Bible study. And God used all of those things and many more to shape my desire to minister in the local church. And as I think about that now, preaching this passage this morning, I can't help but wonder, for me now in the year 2020, and for all of you, for all of you tuning in at home, how does God want to use this paragraph today to maybe fundamentally change the course of your life? And maybe you're not you know, an 18-year-old brand new Christian like I was reading it, but you can read it with brand new eyes this morning. How long have you been following Jesus? How brand new are you to this whole thing? Will you read this passage with me this morning with brand new eyes and ask God what He wants to do in your heart and in your life this morning? Father, as we ask that question, what do you want to do? what you want to accomplish, how you want to change us, how you want to transform us more and more into the pattern and the likeness of Jesus. God, would you help us to have quiet hearts that can hear you? And God, would you help us to have a courageous faith that says yes to you? I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this, this, uh, these two paragraphs, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and then 5 through 11, form the heart of Paul's entire letter to the Philippians. So if you are taking notes, if you're uh, writing stuff down in the margin of your Bible, if, if you're keeping a journal about Philippians as we go through this, write down, this is the heart of the letter. Everything that Paul do is building up to this or flows from this in the letter. And the point that he is making here. The point that he is making here is central to his appeal to the Philippian believers, right? Because remember, Paul is in chains in Rome. He's heard from someone from the church at Philippi named Epaphroditus. And he, uh, Epaphroditus came with a gift to love and care for, support Paul while he was in chains. And then Paul gets an update from him about the church in Philippi. And so as Paul is hearing about what's going on, right, you can just imagine it is breaking his heart to hear that division and divisiveness has become the defining feature of the church that he planted some years before that. Okay, so the culture of the church now is defined by division and divisiveness. Paul's addressing it throughout the letter, and he is addressing it with an appeal to unity. 
right? Because disunity is the major problem that the Philippians were facing, an appeal to unity forms the heart of the letter as Paul's main response here to what he is saying. So he's heard from Epaphroditus. He's writing this now to the Philippians, and that's where we pick up, right? 2,000 years later, getting both the spiritual and the practical implications of what Paul is saying here about unity. And both of those implications, both spiritual and practical, are absolutely massive for us in the church today. So do not think, right, that this was written a long time ago in a place far, far away. And so, yeah, whatever he says, it may be interesting, but it's not really going to impact my life. If we listen to Paul here, if we listen to his heart, we listen to where he's pointing us, the change that he wants for us, it can absolutely change the course of of our lives. So look with me at, uh, sorry, verses one and two. This is the first of two major points Paul has here. And the first is this, that unity is a gift we receive. Okay, unity is a gift we receive. Chapter two, verses one and two. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion. You hear what Paul's doing them doing there? He is calling them back to the benefits of the gift that they've received. He's saying, if you have this, the implication is clear from Paul. You do have this. You do have these things. You do have encouragement from being united with Christ. You do have comfort from his love. You do have fellowship with the spirit. You have, God has replaced your heart of stone and given you a heart of flesh that can experience tenderness and compassion. These are the real, tangible, practical benefits to this gift of being united with Christ that God has given to you. And we receive those same things, don't we? We receive those exact same things when we trust Jesus for the very first time. So if you follow Paul's logic here, right? He's saying, listen guys, you've been united to the same person, Jesus. God has united you to Jesus through faith in his name. You've all been united by the same thing, his love. It is God's love that comes and rescues us from sin and death. Remember the Upper Room series, Jesus' death is the fullest expression, the clearest expression of God's character and his love for us. And then he says, you've all been united in the same fellowship, the presence of God with you continually through the Spirit. So why, why in the world would you allow yourselves to become divided? If all of these massive spiritual things have happened to unite you, Why would you give that all away and allow disunity to creep in and take root in your church? That's the appeal that Paul is making to them. And then what he says next is really interesting. He says, make my joy complete. Make my joy complete. What part of Paul's joy is incomplete in that moment? What part of of Paul's joy is, is just not clicking, right? That's the sense that you get. There's something missing there. Paul knows that a threat to the unity of the church is a threat to the mission of the church. And if you remember previously, Paul has a laser focus on the mission of God. He knows that the Philippians are wasting the gift of unity that they have been given. They are wasting it. They are not taking that ball and running with it. They are laying it down of their own accord so that they can bicker and fight and argue and complain against each other and with each other. And he knows that in that environment, in that culture, the mission of God will never be accomplished among the Philippians because they are too busy, they are too consumed by what they have against each other to ever work with each other in accomplishing the mission that God has set before them. And I wonder if you've thought about that for us here at Calvary West. I wonder if you've ever thought about the way that we give away We set aside, we waste the gift of unity that we've been given on things far less significant than the mission of God, on things like politics, on things like preferences, on things like career or sports or academics or whatever. And here's the the kind of crazy realization. Because we set aside the gift of unity that we've been given, Paul is saying, just like me, you will not experience a full joy if you are not united together in the church. And yet we blame everything else, right, for our lack of joy in the church, except for the fact 
that we care way more about things that are not really significant eternally than we do about things that are significant eternally. We allow those things to define our mindset about church, our attitude towards church, our attitude towards each other. We set aside that gift of unity, and and so we set aside the mission. And Paul is saying, if you are not united around the mission of God, you will never experience the fullness of joy. He says, even as someone who loves the church at Philippi, he is not experiencing the fullness of joy because they have set aside the gift of unity. So, when we pursue that, uh, sorry, when we receive that gift together, when it becomes the focal point of, of what we're doing, the unity that God has for us, the mission that he's called us to, then we can pursue the calling to unity. And that's Paul's second main point here. Unity is a gift we receive. First of all, unity is also a calling that we pursue. Unity is a calling that we pursue in the church. Listen to verses 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Right off the bat, you hear how action-oriented Paul is being here, right? The first is all about what we receive. The second is all about what we do. He is being action-oriented because this is a calling that we pursue in verses 3 and 4. Paul never calls us to action without also telling us what is supposed to be motivating that action. And that's why he focuses on the gift that we've received first, right? Here's what you have from God. Now this is what God is calling you to. If he only ever focused here on the what God is calling us to, we would never have a right and lasting motivation for the thing that he's calling us to. It would just be about doing the thing, right? Checking the box, working together, you know, working on this plan that we have for ourselves. If that is detached from, divorced from, separated from the right motivation, then what we're doing will never last. What we're doing will never last without the right motivation. It's got to come from the heart. So Paul points to our hearts. Sorry, he points our hearts in the right direction first. But it's not just an idea for Paul. Hey, you've been given these great things. Now think about that. That's where it begins. That's not where it ends. Now pick that ball up and run with it. We've received unity as a gift. Now let's pursue unity with our lives. And how? How does that happen? That's the right question to be asking. Paul makes it very clear how that happens. Right? We pursue unity through humility. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vacancy, but in humility. But in humility, do the rest of what I'm saying. Consider others better than yourselves. Look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Paul is putting into practice the pattern that he has uh, picked, uh, sorry, that he has written uh, multiple times throughout his letters, right? He, we see this really clearly in Ephesians chapter 4. And the pattern is this. Paul says, stop doing this thing that is bad for you and for others. Stop this sinful pattern. Focus your heart and mind in the right place. And then start doing the thing that God said is really good and best for you. Start growing in your trust and obedience of God. So it's never just stop. Paul is never wagging his finger at us. Paul is never shaming us. Paul is never just, oh, just cut it out, would you? That's never Paul's attitude towards the people that he is, I mean, he is rebuking the Philippians here, right, for their lack of unity. But Paul is not yelling at them. He's not screaming. He's not frustrated. He's not shaming them. Paul is always calling them and us to something better. So when we apply that pattern, right, towards this, the lack of unity in the church, Paul says that we are to stop being motivated by A, selfish ambition, and B, vain conceit. Two things to set aside, two things to put down in our lives, two things to work to kill off in our lives. Selfish ambition and vain conceit. Selfish ambition is that desire to get ahead, the desire to put yourself first, the desire that at the expense of others, I will make sure I am taken care of. I will make sure that I get mine. It's the action-oriented part that he's talking about there, selfish ambition. And then vain conceit, that's the desire to be seen as better than others. So where selfish ambition is all about our action, vain conceit is all about our attitude. And Paul is saying from every angle, 
kill off pride in your life, a pride that would put you first above everyone else and pick up humility. Paul knows that both selfish ambition and vain conceit are a threat to the, hum- sorry, are a threat to the unity of the church. They're a threat to the unity of the church. And so, they're a threat to the mission of the church. You and I will never cooperate together to accomplish the mission of God if we're only ever looking out for ourselves. If I'm so busy trying to get ahead of you, I can never be like-minded with you. If I'm too busy loving myself and do, loving myself and doing what's best for me, it can never be said that we share the same love, what Paul says in verse 2. Selfish ambition and vain conceit are a threat to the unity of the church, and so they're a threat to the mission of the church. But again, Paul's not just saying to stop it and then leave us wondering like, okay, so what, Paul? What do you want from us? I hear you saying, don't try to get ahead. Don't think that I'm better than everybody else. But like, but what do I do next? He tells us exactly what that thing is. The better way is the way of humility. The better way for us is the way of humility. The way back to unity for the Philippians and for us when, when division and divisiveness and disunity and argumentation and fragmentation takes root in the church, the way back for us is the same exact way. It's the way of humility. Now, this is where things get a little bit tricky for us, right? Because who gets to decide what counts as humility? Who gets to define what what humility is for us? And in our culture, right, we're living in a time when the pervasive message is a message of of self-care and self-realization. Listen, you've got to take care of yourself. Nobody else will do that for you, so you have to look out for you. If people are in the way of that, if they're standing as obstacles to that, you've got to set them aside so that you can enthusiastically, wholeheartedly, you know, pursue the thing that you have said is the goal for your life. And you've probably heard that in lots of different ways, lots of different contexts. You may have heard that baptized into church language as well in different ways, but the core of the message is the same, right? Anybody who doesn't fully, completely, enthusiastically support your goals for your life should be set aside or worked around. Nobody's going to look out for you. You have to do it for yourself. What place does humility have in a culture like that? And the answer is none, because that's not humility. But humility now in our culture is being redefined in service of that prevailing culture, of self-care and self-realization. But humility is not really about centering yourself so that you can achieve all of your greatest dreams and desires. That's not what biblical humility is about. Biblical humility on the other end of that spectrum is also not about putting yourself down and missing the fact that you're created in the image of God and therefore have an incredible gift of value and dignity. So we have to avoid the error on both ends of that spectrum, right? Where we would say, hey, if I'm going to be humble, that means that I have got to prioritize myself. I've got to center myself in every story so that I can achieve the things that I want for my life. We say no to that. And we also say no to the idea that humility is a sense of false modesty where I'm always putting myself down and beating myself up and missing the image of God in me. That is not humility either. True biblical humility, Paul says in Romans 12, 3, is is pretty simple, actually. It's having an accurate view of yourself. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Tim Keller calls this the freedom of self-forgetfulness. I love that idea, the freedom of self-forgetfulness. Here's the idea. The idea is that if I am viewing myself as God views me, and I am recognizing what God has done for me, then I will know that I am already as loved and as accepted as I will ever be. I am already, through Jesus, as loved and as accepted as I will ever be, And so I don't have to fight for those things for myself. I don't have to strive for those things for myself. I receive those things as a gift. 
And therefore, rather than prioritizing myself to earn God's love and acceptance, or beating myself up because I feel so far away from God's love and acceptance, I can actually forget myself. Let my identity be fully consumed by who God says I am, and I can prioritize others in my everyday life. That is true and biblical humility. So that sounds pretty contrary, right? In a time where personal identity and ambition is everything, the biblical call to humility really is radical. It was radical when Paul said it to the Philippians. It is radical for us today. That we would consider others better. That means considering them first. That means in my thinking, in my planning, whether it's day-to-day thinking and planning or year-to-year thinking and planning. This is where I want my family to be in five years. This is where I want my family to be economically when I retire. These are the accounts I'm setting up for my kids so that they can go to college. These are the things that I want for myself academically as a student so I can be prepared for what's next, higher education or the workforce or whatever. In big plans and in little plans, biblical humility means that I think first not of myself, but I think first of others. What would it look like for me to plan in a way that my life is a benefit to those around me? What would it look like for me to plan my day, my week, my next five years in a way that my life is a benefit to those around me, that I'm not just looking out for my own interests? Notice Paul doesn't say never look out for your own interests. He says not just for your own interests. Yes, we understand that you need to take care of yourself and your family economically, Paul's saying. Yes, I understand that you have goals and desires for your life, but those shouldn't be the only things that you focus on. Also think about the interests of others. And when we do that, right, when we do that, when we pursue that calling, then we will be living out the gift we have already received, the gift of unity, when we receive it with thanksgiving and with joy, when we center our hearts and our minds around what we've already been given from God, encouragement from being united with Christ, comfort from his love, fellowship with his spirit, right? And we unite ourselves together to focus on the mission of God, then we can begin to live out the calling to unity in everyday life. So those are Paul's Paul's two big points there. I I wanna offer a reflection on those as we wrap up. And the reflection is this. Unity is not a gimme. Okay, unity is not a gimme. Now, you guys know I love to golf. And in golf, a gimme is when your ball is within about a two-foot radius of the cup. Okay? So if your ball is within about the length from the end of your putter to the grip of your putter, then it's a gimme. You don't have to put it out. And the idea there is, is it's as good as made. Okay? And so you just pick the ball up, walk back to the cart, Now, some people, if you're a stickler for the rules, right, you put everything out. There are no gimmies, okay? That's how I grew up with my grandfather. But but most other people in the world, right, play, and it's just, hey, we're not playing for money. We're not playing for a competition. You pick that up. It's a gimme. I think a lot of us think of unity in the church in the same way. Sometimes in golf, it's funny. If your ball might not be quite within two feet, Right, you like kind of wait to see how everybody else does. Generally, if everybody else makes their putts, they feel good about themselves and they'll give you a little bit longer of a gimme. So if you just hang back a little bit, right, maybe it's not quite in the margin, but if everybody else feels good about their putts, they might feel good about your putt too. Hey, just pick that up, man. Don't worry about it. It's a gimme. I think sometimes we wait, we hang back when it comes to unity. It's like maybe somebody will just hand it to me. Maybe somebody will just give it to me, right? Maybe I don't really have to work that hard to kill off my selfish ambition. Maybe I don't really have to work that hard to, to shave off the rough edges of my vain conceit. Maybe somebody will just hand that to me one day. Maybe I can keep up the caustic tone of my social media posts and we can still be united. Maybe I can keep talking about people and gossiping and slandering and, and, and somebody will just hand me unity even though I have for years cultivated this way of talking about my brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe it'll just be a gimme. And as I reflect on what Paul says here, and that is a false and a dangerous assumption to make. I think that all of us sort of want to make that assumption. 
that it's going to be easier than maybe it seems like it really will be to be united together in the church, to be united around the mission of God, to be killing off selfish ambition and vain conceit, to be cultivating humility in our hearts and in our lives. And we, so we want that so badly to just come naturally to us. It just won't. It just won't. Our hearts are self-seeking. They are tuned to self. And so from the moment we were born to the moment we die, our chief priority is me, self. What do I want? How can I get it? Who's standing in the way? How do I get them out of the way so that I can get what I want? Now, you probably don't live every moment of every day with that thought process. But in much of the tone and tenor of what we say and what we do and how we say it and how we do it, that's the process that's running in the background. It doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come easy to kill that off and to cultivate, to grow up something better. And yet that's exactly what God is calling us to. So my question for us as we close is, are you actively pursuing your calling to unity through humility or are you looking for a gimme? Take a picture of that. I think it's on the screen. I want you to ask yourself this question this week. Man, unity here in the church, but... But what about in other spheres of your life as well? Are you actively pursuing unity with your spouse? Or are you looking for a gimme? Are you actively pursuing unity with your kids or your grandkids? Or are you looking for a gimme? Are you actively pursuing humility with your coworkers or students, with your classmates, with your teammates, with your peers? Or are you hoping that you can just let your life run business as usual and somebody will just come hand you humility, hand you unity. Listen, we will never have that, an active pursuit of unity or humility if we are not first connected to the gift of unity that God has given us. So my second question is this, are you trusting Jesus? Are you trusting Jesus once for salvation the very first time, you may have never trusted Jesus in your life. Now is the time to start. You realize you are so far from a humble life that leads to unity and mission. You've been doing what you want, when you want, and it's time for a change. It is time to say no to self and yes to Jesus. But I'm not just talking about the first time. I'm also talking about when you have that moment to say that thing about that person in a way that you know is not charitable, in a way that you know is not assuming the best. Or if you have a, you have a chance to post that thing about a politician that you don't agree with, you have a chance to, to send that email with a tone that you know will be heard in a certain way. In those moments, in those moments when your kids are grating on your nerves, when your spouse is bothering you in the same way that they bothered you a million times before, when you're disappointed, when you're betrayed, when you're let down, when you're frustrated, when you're hurt, when you've been sinned against, are you trusting Jesus in those moments too? Father, will you help us to trust you? Will you help us to trust that through Jesus you have given us everything we need? Will you help us to trust, God, that, that obeying you really is better than pursuing what we would want for ourselves? Especially, God, as it comes to unity here in your church being united together with these brothers and sisters through one name, Jesus, and one fellowship, the Spirit, for one reason, the mission that you have for us. God, would you unite us together in a way that we can never do for ourselves?
Cabrera West, you can have a seat. And as you do, I want to call your attention back to that connect form on the website. You can access it at the media player. But listen, if, you're, uh, if God is moving in your heart and your life right now, and you want to let us know about that, the way to do that, you can always send us a message, of course, but we will also get that through the connect form. So if you're watching at home and you want to talk to us about trusting Jesus for the very first time or trusting Jesus today with what's going on in your life right now, you can use the connect form to do that. We would love to hear from you. We would love to walk with you through whatever it is that God is leading you through. So I want to be clear about that. The connect form on the website, or you can always shoot us a message. Now, as we close out tonight, our high schoolers are having a back to school pool party. If you need information about that, it's on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, Instagram and Facebook, both. The tag is Calvary West. So just search for that and you'll find all the information there. I believe it is tonight from 530 to 730 and Clement's It's going to be a great time. And uh, we would love for you and your high schooler uh, to be there. That is ninth graders through 12th graders tonight, 5.30 to 7.30. Second thing is this tonight at 7 o'clock, Pastor Will and a few other leaders are going to be doing a church-wide update as we prepare to move into phase three and we look ahead to the fall. So uh, you can watch that live tonight at 7 or it'll be available on the website throughout the week as well. Last thing is this, in the month of September, this is really important, in the month of September, we are going to be doing the Lord's Supper together every week. Okay, the reason we're going to do it every week is because we recognize that people can't be here every single week. We have a limited capacity, but as you look around the room, if you're watching on home, you can't see around the room, but we have plenty of space for you. So as many times as you would like in the month of September, but at least once, we would love for you to join us to take the Lord's Supper together. It's going to be at the end of all of our services, and so we want that to be for people who can be together in the room with us. If for some reason you cannot be in the room with us, you got something going on medically, you're homebound, let us know so that we can make sure we come to you for the Lord's Supper in the month of September. But again, we have plenty of room. So if you want to be here with us more than one week in September, we've been trying to kind of keep it limited in August to see how things go. And so we feel like we've got a good handle on that. And we would love to see you more in the month of September. Now, let's stand together. Actually, let's stay seated together because we got to give you guys a couple of announcements. But you've heard the message from Paul. It's a call to unity, right? And we know the mission of God. It is to see people reconciled to himself through Jesus. So Calvary West, you are sent.